Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us in really a session that I am delighted to be moderating. My name is Mina Al Arabi. I'm the editor in chief of the national newspaper here in the UAE. And I have the distinct pleasure of moderating a conversation with His Excellency, President of Sierra Leone, President Rio. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. Reading and learning more and more about Sierra Leone, you realize what an incredible country it is, but also to have um, a head of state that has a decorated history in the military and in the armed forces. Somebody who had the opportunity to be in power in 1996, but handed over power to a civilian government. Somebody who studied in the United States and has a master's from the American University in Washington International Relations. Um, and also has an incredible uh, experience in the private sector when you went back to Sierra Leone in 2008 and established a cocoa and coffee um, farming company. So you have this wide experience inside your own country, uh, time that you've spent in the United States, and coming with a program where your flagship project is to invest in human capital. Mm -hmm. And we're here at the Global Education and Skills Forum to talk about education, skills, but at the heart of it is really human capital. So I'd like to start by asking you about this vision that you have. You've now been uh, president just a little under a year from mm -hmm. April 2018, and you came with this promise to your people, to your country, to invest in human capital. What does that mean? Thank you very much. Um, Sierra Leone is a small West African nation, and um, it is endowed with a lot of natural resources like diamond, gold, rutile, bauxite, you name it. We've been exploiting that for quite a while, but in terms of tangible things to show for, for that, we really don't have. So when I decided I was going to vie for the leadership of this country, having also benefited quite a lot from education, I, after our own social diagnosis of the situation, we decided as a group with my leadership that if we have to go forward as a nation, if we have to develop which we need and which our people are expectantly waiting for, we need it to pay attention to the human resource base of our country. We have not, not forgotten about the many resources that we have, the gold, the diamond, the rutile, the bauxite, and everything, but we want to see those as a means mm -hmm. to develop an, our human capital. Why human capital? Because for me, I have experienced the power of education. I have lived through it. And I'm sitting here, I think, to a very great extent, because of education. I come from a very humble background. My mom never went to school. She was not fortunate. My dad did, but he died before I started school. I came from a little village, not even from the city. But I'm, today, I'm sitting at the state house. I started school, and I was going to school without shoes. Today I can wear a beautiful pair of shoes. <laughs> and um, I want to, I believe in the march from my village to the state house, education played a dominant role. And um, because in Sierra Leone, a lot of people are dropping out of school mm. for a mere $20 a year for a, to keep a, a kid in school, that is not something that I can be a silent witness to. So I decided that the most important resource in our country is the human being, and therefore we should enhance the quality of the human being, and the best way to invest in the human being is to give education. And so... <laughs> and so then... So the strategy, the vision is there. So for the implementation, as you said, there are financial challenges for the country. There are also financial challenges for families. How do you overcome these financial challenges in order to provide primary and secondary education for all of Sierra Leone's children and youth? 
In fact, when I suggested that I was going to make education the flagship program uh, for my government and uh, staked my whole campaign on that, the opposition and quite a lot of other people said, you must be kidding. And they asked, where are you going to get the money? Do you even know how many kids are in school? It is impossible. But for me, it, quality education for our kids is an existential business in the 21st century. To be a meaningful part of the 21st century, you must have a solid education. Mm -hmm. Without that, you are going to be at the receiving end of globalization. And you all know you don't want to be at that end. So I decided that however expensive it was, I was going to make sure that we made it our flagship program. And it is our flagship program. As expensive as it is, within five months, I launched a program that paid for all the kids in Sierra Leone so that they can go to school. In addition, provided core textbooks and learning materials for teachers to be able to make education available for all kids in Sierra Leone. Now we are working on making the quality competitive so that they can, our kids can go out in the world knowing that they are well educated and they have quality education and, are com and compete around the world. You know, investing in education is one of those long-term investments. And so to actually see the fruits of the investments that you're making will take some time. So how do you, in the meantime, try to accelerate development in the country? Well, um, national issues are never that simplistic as they seem. And in my opinion, the world is talking about, the UN and other international institutions are talking about sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Sustainable development goals they have established and trying to make sure we accomplish those. But from our own examination of our situation, which is very important, we realize that we cannot even embark on that process mm. of development. So we don't even talk about sustainable. And to even embark on the development, which as you very well know is a very complex issue, those nations that are, are leading the world today are still developing. Mm -hmm. We decided that um, education is so important, however expensive it might be, we have to follow that. Mm -hmm. So some said you don't have the money and it is very expensive to embark on, 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 on education as a project as a, of a nation. There are other issues, but for me, like I've said before, it, it is an existential thing for us as a nation if we want to be a meaningful part of the uh, uh, um, 21st century. If we want our people include, to be involved in the process of development and to be part of it mm -hmm. in a way that they, they can also uh, um, be productive, there has to be quality education. Quality education gives them the tools and the means to be part of the process. You cannot embark on sustainable development without an educative, educated community or country. Because even we who claim to be educated are still grappling with the many paradigms mm -hmm. of development. We pick one today and drop it tomorrow and another one crops up another day. So how do you want, a, how do you expect a country with only three out of five adults. Who, uh, three out of five adults cannot read and write. So for me, I prioritized education. Not that I don't have the intention to develop other things. We are working on different aspects of state um, uh, governance, mm -hmm. but we are making education priority. And for me, I'm not looking at education from a narrow perspective. Mm -hmm. I consider education as holistic. And uh, therefore, we actually say, said it's going to be human capital development. Mm -hmm. And that human capital development means we take care of uh, the health of the human being, the food security for us all to have food, and also uh, feed the brain. We feed the brain, the tummy, and take care of the body, and that person is ready to good to go in the 21st century. So, 
agriculture, health, and education, the three pillars. But really to get either agriculture or health to be strong, you will need education. So that's become your cornerstone, the infrastructure from which you can build everything on. I want to ask you about technology. You've uh, spoken um, at length about the importance of technology and the role that technology can play in developing not only the education sector, but the country at large. And some people will ask and say, well, there are many countries around the world that are competing to become technological hubs. What would make Sierra Leone stand out? Well, um, <clears throat> in the first place, uh, we are very serious about uh, technology as part of the, um, the, the momentum to, to, to go forward as far as uh, development is concerned. Two weeks ago, I was at MIT mm -hmm. and uh, Harvard, and we went to establish partnership with those institutions to be able that, to leverage the connections <clears throat> so that we can actually uh, use technology to deliver and to help us in the process of governance in Sierra Leone. Many countries, of course, uh, every country is making an effort to, to lead, mm -hmm. but we have not only given it priority because we know it will quicken our move to, to catch up with the rest of the world, but we also know it will make our processes of governance, uh, taking care of health, taking care of education, uh, taking care of governance itself, and simplify others' uh, processes of governance. Mm -hmm. So we are using it not only as a means to deliver education, mm -hmm. but we have identified technology science and innovation as a way to catch up with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the quantum leap, that leapfrogging in development is necessary if we have to catch up with the rest of the world. And only technology can help us do that. Also, um, of more importance uh, as far as technology is concerned is the fact that um, teachers are a, diff are, are a very important component of all of this uh, equation. But it is not going to be easy to train teachers for nearly two million uh, students. So we want to use the effect of technology, innovate around the processes that we've been using to deliver tuition, mm -hmm. so that we can use technology and beam into our classes uh, quality tuition to all the uh, uh, kids, even in the far to rich areas of our country. So that way we can quickly bring um, 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 quality education to our people Why we are making the effort. You can never do it when there's no substitute for good teachers, mm -hmm. we're motivated teachers. So we want to uh, use education, I mean our technology. Mm -hmm. Why we think, we have, we have a, a smart set of people in our country. I've already put together um, <clears throat> a, a, a group of young people and I don't know if my Okay, my chief innovator is here. <laughs> He's already, you can get up, let them see you. <clears throat> what we do is, um, every challenge we have, we throw it to them as a group of young people, and they innovate around that challenge, either using technology or science, and we've been able to find very interesting and refreshing solutions to certain perennial problems in Sierra Leone. So we, are, we have challenged them with that question. Mm -hmm. How can you make us lead the world mm -hmm. in our innovation from one of the poorest countries, one country that has been um, completely tagged with the negative um, labors of war, Ebola, and all of these things. It's a new day in Sierra Leone, and uh, we are up to the challenge, and we are working towards that. Uh, he uh, leads a group of, um, he's, he's himself an inventor, um, from Harvard and, um, um, and, and MIT. Uh, it's, it was extremely difficult to get him out from where he was working with <laughs> IBM. But um, that is how determined we are. Yeah. We are getting all of them together. Um, uh, he's leading that group. And every challenge we have, we throw into their hands mm -hmm. and they've been able to innovate, find ways so that we can actually move forward as a nation. This idea of tapping into diaspora, the idea of those who had 
left the country during a, a difficult period in the country's history and bringing them back. What is, what is the pull factor to bring back talent to the country? I think um, that normally we, we, we talk about um, a buoyant economy, mm -hmm. one that can provide jobs for them, um, also improvement in other social amenities, because once you get used to uh, the, the outside world, you want to be able to get, um, to live hap I mean, uh, happily. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's extremely difficult in the third world, where electricity is difficult, where water supply is difficult, everything is difficult, actually. So uh, we have to find ways to provide those amenities back home. But aside from that, for quite a lot of them, actually, uh, in my government, we've had to bring uh, the professor sitting, even my wife was in the diaspora, um, I had to... <laughs> That's one way I, to I, attract I, I normally forget. <laughs> Uh, they, they come back with a lot of experience. The professor was a quintessential academic in some uh, university deep in the UK. I had to bring him here also because there is an intellectual aspect to visionary leadership. Mm -hmm. You can't take that out. The, of course, there is a, a practical aspect to, to leadership, but it has to be informed. Mm -hmm. And that is why we are bringing the best brains. Uh, when they want to theorize, we change the theory into practice. We allow them to give us the theories and we translate that into policies that positively impact. So the pool actually is, now I, I do get approaches quite often. People they say we want to be part of this success story. Mm -hmm. So you have to be successful at home. You have to give hope. You have to inspire. And I, I met uh, um, a colleague of ours, um, a Sri Lankan mm -hmm. at the World Bank. He said, I want to come back. I said, but you are better paid here, he said, I want to be part of the success story. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants to be part of the success story. So you have to be successful, and then you can have that pull factor mm -hmm. to get people coming back. I want to uh, go back to a point that you raised, which is the issue of adult illiteracy. Because of course, investing in education is very important, early development of children, primary education, secondary education, and so forth. But you also have a reality of, of those who need to get into uh, jobs today and creating job opportunities for those who are adults. How do you deal with that? How do you go about ensuring that they have certain skill levels, even if it's not traditional education, and providing opportunities for them? It's all part of this package. I, I came with my education minister. He, he was around this morning. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Somebody's probably pulled him into he, one of the many he, meetings he, he, that Yes, are exactly. Um, what education for us is holistic. Mm. Uh, from numeracy to adult literacy, these are all things that, are, uh, that, that, that form part of our program. Mm -hmm. We had an 11-year war in our country. We've had a series of um, situations that have deprived quite a lot of people from going to school. Yeah. They will become and they are already liability if we do not give them the skills to self-employ and also to be useful to other people. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is um, when we talk about education, there's an whole aspect of skills training, which we give these people who are beyond the normal education age to acquire skills mm -hmm. and knowledge that will make them productive. And those skills and, and knowledge definitely have to be part of what is useful today, mm -hmm. not uh, the old things that don't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, numeracy, even for our uh, the people in the villages is important mm -hmm. because as we try to encourage them to move towards doing little businesses, especially to empower women, mm -hmm. they have to know, uh, they have to be literate mm -hmm. in, in terms of their numeracy skills so that they can comfortably take care of their um, businesses and take care of their families. Mm -hmm. So numeracy, adult uh, literacy and uh, skills training mm -hmm form an important component of education. Of course, you have the traditional or the academic aspect, which is 
all there. So it is all of this that we put together in order to, to that we call education. It's, it's, we are not living any aspect. We believe that teachers are important in this. And the sort of education that we want to give is one that we make our people global nomads. Mm -hmm. People who can go into the world and be problem solvers. Not just the traditional geography, history, mm -hmm. and all of this sort of thing. We want to leapfrog even in, the, in terms of the quality and the, the type of education we are going to give. Mm -hmm. Because we live today in a global world, mm -hmm. um, highly interconnected. No problems are, are, are local today. And uh, we have to make sure that our kids who live Sierra Leone can survive and thrive, not, not survive, can thrive anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. Can I? You know, I'm, I'm originally from Iraq. And um, there are similarities um, somewhat between our countries in terms of being having great resources, both natural resources and, and human capital, but mm -hmm. have had difficult recent histories. And so one of the things um, you know, I think about and, and people who think about from countries that have gone through conflict is how education can enable, pe enable peace building and maintain peace and thrive, as you said. How do you see peace building, reconciliation in education? As a peace student myself, most of the challenges we've had in the past that lead to violent conflicts is actually lack of proper knowledge. That is one. And also a lack of leadership, either at, at the world level or at home. Mm. In order to bring about peace, there's need to understand one another in any given set of uh, communities. Dialogue is important. And when, if you are truly educated, you see the need for us to live in diversity because we live in diversity today. And when you have useful education, it tells you you can live with anybody around the world. You can live with in any society. You only have to be sensitive to what is happening around you, that you are not the same with the next person. You don't belong to the same um, religion like the next person. But that doesn't mean uh, that you are totally different. There is a common trend. You are all human beings. Be you black, white, Arab, you are all human beings. So the, the, and this was the type of education I was talking about, making our kids global nomads. Mm. To know that we, there, is, there is so much richness in diversity. We don't have to quarrel about diversity. And that when there are challenges, Dialogue is the best way because when we go into conflict, we dehumanize the others. But when, 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 when you dialogue with people, you get to see where they are coming from. And that can resolve the issues. It is because we dehumanize and the next thing will be definitely to get rid of the other person because you think he or she is not in the same class or grouping that you think. So, Part of the education that we should have in today's world is one that has to respect diversity. Mm -hmm. We are all different. Even from the same mothers, you can be different. If we can make peace education as it has become a serious situation in the world, and because the boundaries don't exist anymore, we are going to move across boundaries. So we have to respect the culture of other people. If we can do that, it can help us to actually uh, live in harmony. In terms of peace building, I think um, education definitely, uh, in some of the cases, what has led to the violent conflicts, especially in Africa and other parts of the world, is the lack of opportunities, mm -hmm. the lack of development itself. Uh, people have taken to the bush because there is development happening and they are not part of it. That is lack of inclusive development. People have taken to the bush because the leaders are too corrupt. Whatever belongs to the state belongs to their pocket. I think if we really organize our educational system in such a way to capture some of the challenges or the most 
critical challenges we are facing around the world. The, the, those uh, uh, um, um, issues should be part of our education so that we will prevent um, 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 conflicts that can lead to uh, I mean, the mass ma massacres that we have experienced in the world. So for me, education will help to stick to the people together and also help us to understand the needs of other people, knowing that they are totally different from who we are. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I could carry on for many more questions, but I'm going to upset the audience. So I want to be fair and open the floor. There are mics around. If you could please raise your hand. Um, Okay, so there's one, two over here, and then I, I will come to others. So if we could take the first two questions, the lady at the front and then the lady at the, behind her, and then we'll, we'll take two at a time if that's okay, okay. with you. It's an honor uh, asking this question to you, sir. Uh, it was great, great listening to you about the vision you had, uh, but I was really curious to know, uh, generally when a leader has a certain vision in his mind and there is a team that he has to drive. Uh, it's really important that the same vision is uh, penetrated through all the layers into the team uh, till it reaches the end target audience, where in your case was your citizens. Uh, so how did you manage? Because you just mentioned in one of your responses that how when you set education as your flagship program, there were people who questioned that particular vision. So in that situation, how was it that you actually drove so many people around towards the same vision? Because I'm sure it's not just a one person's vision that can drive a change, sure. but it's just a team thing. Thank you. The lady at the back. Your Excellency, good afternoon. Sir. My name is Toyosi Akirele Ogushiji. I come from Nigeria. I'm the founder of PassNow Now, which is the most used mobile learning platform in my country. Um, I wanted to ask you a question that may, that, let me go to, quick to the question. Yes, please. Because I'm trying not to be controversial. Mm -hmm. If we were in Africa, I'd probably ask it in a tougher way. Africa is the country, they, de they describe us often as the young continent. And we've got 54 countries, and in that continent, half of those countries have leaders that are in the realm of their 60s and their 70s. Now, we're here discussing education technology, which is hinged on innovation and new, deep transformational technologies. How do we, and how do you, people like you, as one of the few progressive leaders in the, on the continent, how are you going to commit more to youth inclusion mm -hmm. such that you can Im improve policies that reflect the aspirations of this emerging generation? Because when you think about the fact that uh, the young people of Africa are the ones who put Africa on the map globally. All of this innovation we're talking about is, de is developed by young people like me. However, we don't get a seat at the table. How are you going to make sure that education and innovation yeah. is mainstreamed into your policy and your agenda? Thank you as a much. country on a continent. Thank you. Okay, so those two questions, communicating to a team but also to your people to get on board a vision. How do you do that? I think the function of leadership is to inspire and give hope. Um, I remember at the World Bank, um, somebody said, you have infected us with human capital development. You have to infect your whole country you have to let them know that you're not doing this for votes. You have to let them understand the importance of this for the survivor of the country itself. You have to let them know that I'm not doing it for myself, for my own children only. In fact, it is an equalizer. It gives the universal key to open doors everywhere. So what I am doing by declaring free quality education for every child in Sierra Leone is actually making sure that we, we are actually redistributing wealth. What others had appropriated to themselves and used or kept in their pocket, we are putting out by making sure that we pay for all kids. So once now, uh, four, five months after being elected, I declared or launched the free quality education. Every part of the country is benefiting from it. As a poor country, to 
most of whom, uh, most families have three to four children in school. When you pay for all of them and you give them textbooks and you provide food for them and uniforms, no, you have to be really ungrateful not to understand what is happening. But when people see the utility and uh, that this is meant for everybody and that what others had used for themselves, we are putting out there at great... 21% of our whole budget is allocated to education. They will understand. They will support you. And that is what we are enjoying in Sierra Leone. People, if you ask the, even the, 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 the youngest kid on the street about free quality education, they know what it means, and they say this government has brought about this development. So youth inclusion, it's a young continent how to get more young people in the decision-making process on the table, as the lady asked. Especially as it relates to technology and other issues, yeah. is to get young people involved. Uh, I think the young man who stood, the, uh, or the man who stood just now is a young man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is in charge of, uh, he sits at the state house, he is in charge of the whole uh, science, uh, technology, and innovation business in Sierra Leone. Great. Okay, so we have a question here. The gentleman in the second row, and then we'll come to you. But first, the gentleman. Uh, sir, um, no. so, yes, microphone. Yeah, the translator won't hear otherwise. You have to use the microphone. Um, hello. Um, I'm a student from Sierra Leone, and I'm Sierra Leonean. Um, so you're talking about education, and it's really inspiring. But the only th thing is, lately there have been some doubts between us Sierra Leoneans and other people around uh, other nations about the quality of our examinations and I'm about to sit my WAS. Um, so I'm just thinking if there, go if there are any plans of yours to reform the way that we're going to be taking our examinations. Okay, thank you, that's a great question. And the gentleman in the next row, please. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Busani Bafan. I write for IPS Africa. My question is about uh, your free education. Uh, many countries have tried this free education model. I would like to find out what uh, measures have you put in place to ensure that this is sustainable and what can the rest of Africa learn from your particular model? Okay. So first question, Th education. Th thank, thank you very much. Um, your concerns are quite legitimate. Um, I've only been in office for about 11 months. I'll be one year next month. And uh, definitely we inherited a very bad situation from examinations to everything in Sierra Leone had gone down the drain. Um, two days before I left to come here, the West African Examination Council was actually in Sierra Leone. And my word to them is, I am making efforts to improve education in my country. I, w I hold you responsible for making sure that the integrity of our examination, West African Examination Council, we take care of that. It is a legitimate concern. A lot of things had gone wrong with the, the, the process, and uh, it was no longer valued as a certificate. What we are trying to do is to change that narrative. That is what I can say to you, and uh, I'm very happy. I wish you um, good luck. Yes, and I hope uh, with everything that we are putting into that, we'll be able to make your piece of paper from West Africa valuable around the world. How um, sustainable? Yes, sustainable. The free quality education, which we launched, actually we had to rush into because um, African leaders are notoriously known for not delivering on their promises. <laughs> At the time I took over, Maybe not just Africa, even politicians generally around the world. <laughs> so when I took over in, in April, the, our academic uh, year starts in September. It was a very short time to prepare fully for free quality education, taking into consideration the various components. But I had already made a pledge, and for me, like I've said before, Quality education for our kids is an existential business for us. There is no hiding about it. There is no, uh, it's not politics. We want to make sure that we have 
a generation of innovators in Sierra Leone. We want to make sure that we are again champions of human capital development as we have already been recognized. So we are in the process of putting in place all the pillars that we support quality education. I think we will be in place to be an example to, from, from which other countries can learn maybe in a few years. But we are still in the process of putting our own acts together. And um, maybe the only thing you can learn from us now is to know that um, we want to lead and to inspire other countries that the world needs education. We think going to school is education, but we have seen how leadership at the international level, which I basically ascribe to lack of education, is leading us into challenges and problems around the world. So the type of education that we want to provide actually has to be holistic. And the, 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 so when I spoke, we are not limiting. My flagship program is human capital, which means we are taking care of the belly. A hungry teacher is a bad teacher. A hungry student does not listen very well. Learning outcomes when the, when the teacher is hungry or when the student or people is hungry, it's not good, the learning outcomes, in whichever case. The health of the teacher and also the pupil is important. And so for you to be able to stuff, to feed the brain, you have to make sure that the tummy is fed and that, and that human being in which the tummy and that uh, brain exist is also in good shape. So our human capital definition actually has three components, health security, food security, and education, quality education. So for me, and we don't just limit it to that point, you have to also take it to the teachers, quality education. Teachers form an important part of this. We have to make sure that our teachers are well trained and motivated and we teach what is relevant in the world today, what is relevant to make the, our kids become marketable and also contribute not only to global economy, to the global economy, but also to global peace and security. Because it is in that milieu that we all have to live peacefully to be able to make the world go forward. So the, if there's anything to learn from us, it is that holistic approach to, to, to education that we are, that we are, we are embarking on. Okay, I'm going to have to go to this side of the room only because I feel bad that I've ignored this side of the room and then I'll come back. So there's a gentleman at the back and then the gentleman here. So two questions. President Bayo, thank you very much for being here today. My name is Lenny, Lenny Joseph. I'm very similar to the story that you shared. I went to a school without shoes, did not have electricity till I was 12 years old and I think I do have a very nice pair of shoes right now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, really inspired by you, really inspired by the platform on which you ran to win the presidency. I am coming back to Africa. I have a passion for early childhood education. I grew up in Nigeria. Um, and I can tell you that I have seen the document, the strategy document that was released, I think March 1st, that outlines your full strategy on how you're going to close the gap, including human capital development in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm curious about is that there was an $8 billion number for the investments required, and I know you already have most of those funds. I'm curious about what kind of engagement you've got from private enterprises as well as the international community in closing that gap to enable you do what you have in your master plan, which, like I said, is really impressive. Okay, thank you. And if we can get the mic down here, please. Um, would you mind answering that question until we get the microphone? Uh, okay. Yeah, please. Um, I think you're talking about a medium-term development plan. Um, we, we have a gap of about 1.5 billion. Well, if you mean well, well-meaning people will come to your aid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here telling this story, and I've been not around the world, but to a lot of places, and it is interesting how people are catching up how we, are, how we have succeeded to infect at Harvard, at MIT, they are ready to work with us now. Um, in, at the World Bank, 
and other institutions, the African Development Bank, DFID, and other partners, other countries, and other uh, philanthropic groups are coming to our aid. When you, have, uh, uh, when you have a good story to tell, and when people can see it through you that you are genuine about developing the human being, they are ready to let go their pennies to help you do that. So I am sure we are going to be able to meet that. Um, I am never scared of the figures because I know I'm catering for human beings. And for me, human beings and figures cannot be compared. And, and just to elaborate, it's, it, you, and you don't exclude private enterprise for that. So there's the you know, foundations, there's philanthropists, there's governments, there's international aid, but there's also the p private sector can be part of this journey. They have to be a part of it because they benefit most. most when you give quality education, um, how many people go into the public sector? You train very good people who go into the private sector and the hub. Uh, they, 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 they develop. In fact, now when we talk about development, actually we are talking about also um, investment. How do you provide an ecosystem that is friendly to investment? That is to make sure that you can train a, sk a skillful workforce that is ready for them. If that doesn't exist, they are not going there. So they have to be a part of this, and we are trying to see how we can encourage them. Of course, uh, private, the private sector business people like to make as much profit, and, um, they, and some of them are not ready to just uh, plow that profit into the... Um, how do we call it, social issues. Mm -hmm. But I think um, if we can really structure uh, what we are doing properly and for them to understand that uh, part of what we do is for their own existence and their success, mm -hmm. I think a good private sector will be a part of what we are doing. Excellent. Okay, gentlemen here. My name is Gerald Pallister. I come from Zimbabwe. Um, I have two questions, got two parts to it. You've come from a vertical... Uh, career in the military, moving into a horizontal career in politics. The transition from that, Your Excellency, how, how, how did that go? And the second part of my question is, one of the problems we have globally, and specifically in Africa, is corruption. Could you please expound a bit about your views and how you will be tackling corruption in your country? Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, okay, so if I can get a mic, so we've only got three minutes left. If I can just get the mic to this lady, this gentleman, and the lady there, and then we'll wrap it up. But first, Your Excellency, if you can answer those two questions for us. Yeah, I, I mean, um, my background is military, and we believe in giving orders and making sure that those orders are executed <laughs> as we give them. <laughs> what is helping me is the analogy I've made between when I, as a commander in the military, give want to accomplish a particular mission, and I put a, a few people together to go and accomplish that mission. I don't just send them with the verbal orders. I give them the wherewith or the tools, the compasses, the food, whatever it takes to accomplish that. I believe that if we want to live in a peaceful world, if we want to live in a world that continues to change, Change is inevitable. It is the most consistent part of life. We have to make sure that the future generation, our kids, are given all, not just the matching order, but the tools and the, and, and the, uh, and, and the, ev the wherewithal, the compasses. And for, for me, when it relates to education, you want your, your son or daughter to succeed in the world. It's highly competitive, difficult, full of challenges. What do you do? You give him or her the best education, a holistic education. I will assure you, mission will be accomplished. Long after you are dead, that son or daughter will be a world leader. Corruption fighting. Corruption is a threat to national security. It's a threat to everything we've, talk, we, we've, we've talked about. It is not good. It chokes off development. So what I have done 
since coming to office is one, we have a permanent institution that is independent, which has been there for a very long time, but was never given the political support or the free way to do or execute its mandate of curbing corruption in Sierra Leone. So we, we are always regarded as one of the corrupt countries, most corrupt countries in the world. What have I done? I've given them the freedom. I've given them the, the wherewithal to prosecute anybody when that person is found wanting. And in one year, they have been able to, to successful, successfully prosecute almost 100% of their cases, which was never possible before I took over. In addition to that, I have also set up the Commission of Inquiry. That Commission of Inquiry is to force or get those who have been in, in, in positions of leadership to give account of their stewardship. That one is ongoing. Everybody has to account for the monies that have been used. And that one has a lot of traction with the people of Sierra Leone. So for me, corruption is not good. Corruption threatens everything, including national security. It chokes off development, which we are impatient for, for and which we want. And therefore, it is. The fight against corruption we have waged, it is a fight we must fight, and it's a fight we have to win. Okay. okay. So we are out of time, but I'm going to take these very quick questions. The lady here, and then we'll come to... All take. right, so I'll be really... <laughs> go to a point. My name is Daniela. I'm not from Africa. I'm from Colombia. And my question is, do you think entrepreneurship education is a priority or is not a priority? Education and entrepreneurship. And okay. entrepreneurship is. Yep. <laughs> okay, and the final question. Your Excellence, um, how do you ensure the sustainability of this program with you in office and you out of office? And lastly, would you consider running for an office to be the president of Africa? Because we need to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an African, so I can give you that office to you. <laughs> okay. Um, so first, um, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. Um, earlier on, I spoke about education that is relevant to the world in which we live. That is definitely a, comp a component of it. We can't just uh, churn out graduates who cannot uh, create employment for themselves and other people. And quite a lot of people are good, but they are scared to go into that world, the business world. So we have to make sure that it's not just churning out uh, uh, um, 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 graduates who have all the knowledge, but that knowledge about business, because the private sector uh, starts from there. So entrepreneurship, helping them to start up, and really making sure you give them that supportive environment to be able to thrive. I think that is a very good way. Uh, and that deals with also some part of the unemployment which we have. Because every graduate in most countries, when they come out, they are looking out for jobs. But if we can teach them to create jobs in the first place, so they will not only be employing themselves, but other people. So that is an important component. Integrity in education, ensuring that integrity is also a part of this, and? Character and integrity. Definitely, whatever happens, that should be, I think um, we should even start it at home. Because whatever you do in the world, if you, there is no credibility to it, integrity, as a person, in, at, uh, for any institution, you are not going to be able to succeed. So for me, um, it is a given in the world in which you live. 
you only are important as, as important as your own integrity. And that goes again for any institution in the world. Um, I, 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 I just completed my campaign a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> and that is for a small country in Africa. <laughs> so when I multiply that by 54, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to vie for that. But I think... Um, Sustainability, even if you're not in office of the program. Yes. What we want to do is, um, in our development plan, the medium-term development plan, we sold that out to everybody in the country. And that, that provides an answer for somebody who was also asking, how do we make, make sure that, um, how did I get everybody to understand? We involved all the political parties. In fact, we consulted so extensively that nearly two million people out of seven million people were involved in deciding on this. So with that level of extensive consultation, now what we want to do is to even think about legislating it so that it's not just about me as a leader. It's not a legacy uh, that, 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 that comes from me alone. It is a societal legacy because we know it is important. And, we, we, and what I pray for is for the learning outcomes to start to show us quickly so that we can now say, this is good for us as a nation. Whichever political party comes to power should never think about diluting the educational system because it is an existential business. Thank you so much for all your answers. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. A pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.